Will you now join me in the recitation of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Welcome again to St. Paul's Church. My name is Matt Skillen. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you've decided to join us for worship today. We would love to invite you to join us online at stpauls.faith. That's stpauls.faith, where you can click on the Connect With Us button. That's where you can find our digital connection card. We'd love to know who you are, where you're from, and how we can connect with you. This is where you'll also find our online prayer request link. You know, we take prayer very seriously here, and we would love to know how to pray for you this week. Every prayer request that comes in, we lift up as part of our weekly staff meetings. God is moving in amazing ways, and we would love to know how to pray for you. Love to know how he's working in your life. So if you join us there, we would truly appreciate it. 
We also like to take a moment every single week to say thank you to those who are partnering with us in ministry through tithes and offerings. Through your radical generosity, we've been able to continue to keep the operations of St. Paul's moving to be a light here in Elizabethtown and beyond. If you'd like to learn more about partnering with us in this way, you can once again join us at stpauls.faith and learn about e-giving or text to give. Or if you're a regular attender here at St. Paul's, you can use one of our offering stations when you come to church. Wherever God is with you right now, we know that he is moving a great, uh, a great movement in your heart. And we thank you for partnering with us in this way. I'd like to take a moment now just to uh, say a prayer of thanks for all that God is doing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for everything that you give, for everything comes from you. Lord, we ask now that you take this portion that we return and you multiply it several times over so that the name of Jesus can be heard the world over. This is your prayer in your heavenly gracious name. Amen. Now a reading from Micah 6, 8. No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Well, good morning. My name is Dominic Tuttle. I am the director of youth and young adults here at St. Paul's Church. I am so excited to be here with all of you and have this opportunity to share. So I'll begin by telling you a little bit about myself. I am exceedingly fond of The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. As a young teenager, my father read the trilogy out loud to us as kids, did different accents for all the characters, it was great. I saw all three films in theaters multiple times. I've watched every single minute of behind-the-scenes commentaries, uh, all the hidden extras on every DVD that has ever been released. Twice in my life now, I've watched all three extended edition films in a row in one day. It usually takes 12 and a half to 13 hours. I've even read Tolkien's Silmarillion, which, if you haven't heard of it, is the very dry, detailed, slow-moving, and long precursor to The Lord of the Rings. I managed to visit the Eagle and Child pub in uh, 
Oxford, England, while I was studying in the UK. Uh, there, Tolkien would meet with C.S. Lewis and other writers to discuss literature and their own works. Sadly, I wasn't able to sit at their table. I got to sit next to it. That was pretty great. It was one of the highlights of my time in England. I devoted a lot of time to Tolkien's fictional world. And I don't feel guilty about that. But sometimes I wonder where I might be or what I might know if I had devoted that time to prayer or Bible study. Devoted. What an interesting word. Webster's Dictionary defines devotion as religious fervor or piety, an act of prayer or private worship, usually used in plural, devotions. Uh, sometimes it is a religious exercise or practice other than the regular corporate worship activity. While devotion can also mean loyalty, I want to focus on the verb as opposed to the adjective. Let us engage in devotion. Let us be devoted to God. So, what are the actions? What do we do? Well, Micah 6.8 says, No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Something I like to say quite often, I am a simple guy, and I love simple instructions. And the prophet Micah here delivers some delightfully simple directions. What does God want you to do? Do what is right. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Today I want to focus on that last bit of that verse. To walk humbly. In my mind, if I were to walk humbly with someone, I wouldn't be behind them following because then I wouldn't necessarily be with them. I wouldn't be ahead. I'd be beside them because I'm walking with someone. But to walk humbly is to show respect and value of that person that I am walking with. If I respect and value someone, I am going to give them my attention. You might have heard the old saying, we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we talk. I honestly believe that old saying applies to devotion. There are many forms of devotion that have developed over the centuries since Jesus Christ left a bunch of working class folks in charge of keeping the movement going. Some of the classic forms of devotion include pilgrimage, isolation, <clears throat> and making lots and lots of copies of scripture. While there may certainly be great value in said classics today, they are not the most practical for us today, unless it's you know, required isolation, in which case, best you know, follow directions. So let's focus on three traditional methods of devotion that are established in scripture and are just as vitally important for us today, prayer, study, and meditation. Now, my daughter, Sienna, she's five. She's well into that fantastic age where she's thinking about the world around her and asking questions, brilliant questions. Back in Montana, there's this statue and it is titled, Who Gives All Gifts? It's by an artist named Tim Holmes. It's a seated figure with his head bent low and a hand outstretched as though offering something. 
I tried to explain statues to Sienna a while back. The best I could come up with was, it's like a picture of something, but it has a shape. It's not flat. Probably not the best, uh, as she has ever since referred to statues, or that particular statue, as the picture of Jesus. I feel like I got the message across. Well, not too long ago, she suddenly asked, is Jesus real? Not just a picture? Oh, that's a great question. That is a great. My wife answered, yes, he's real. He lives in our hearts. And Sienna thought about this for a moment and then replied, if he's real, how do I talk to him? Oh, now we're getting to the real questions. Prayer, at its most basic, is a conversation. We do not always treat it as such, sadly. I can say from experience that most of my prayers have been a one-sided word dump. Just imagine if someone that you cared about came up and just vented for five minutes straight and didn't let you get a word in edgewise. But then, when they got distracted enough to stop talking, they just walked away and didn't let you say anything back. A lot of us have probably prayed many of those prayers, and that is not bad or wrong. God does care about what we are thinking and feeling, what's bothering us, and what is on our hearts. But the Bible says that God answers Christ himself said in Matthew 7, verse 7, this is from the New King James, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Prayer is about communicating with the Creator about all of your cares and conflicts. There is expression of experience here, and always a reply, if we will listen. In the experience of many who've gone before us, God usually gives us one of three answers to prayer. Yes, no, or wait. Obviously, we prefer one over the others. But it can be hard to hear God's reply. We live in a busy world with plenty of worthwhile distractions. If you're going to have a conversation with a friend, though, which is better, a quiet coffee shop or a busy nightclub? It's been a few years since I went to a nightclub, and let me tell you, it was a waste of time. The music was turned way, way up. Uh, everyone had to shout just to be heard. Dancing wasn't even a big part of the environment. It was just an obnoxiously loud place to quite literally waste time and money, um, I guess unless you speak sign language. The point is, to have a conversation, you need to be relatively free of noise and distractions. Jesus gives us a bit of direction here on this in Matthew 6, verse 6. This is from the message. Here is what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role-play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense His grace. I love the message translation here because it doesn't use any old-fashioned Christianese words like petition, which is asking God for something, or penitence, which is saying sorry. Good words, but you don't have to use those to talk to God. Again, I'm a simple guy. I love simple directions. Find a quiet, secluded place. That used to be called a prayer closet. I'd love to have a separate closet just for praying in. I imagine folding up old prayers and putting them up on a shelf or hanging up my newest prayers that I might be revisiting several times. I think the key value of a quiet place 
to pray is that that bit about the focus shifting from me to God. In prayer, I turn my focus from myself back to him. When Christ teaches his disciples how to pray, he uses the first three or four lines just to focus on God. That is walking humbly. As we devote our time in prayer, we slowly let God take the center of our lives. Now, the second method of devotion here I want to focus on is meditation. There it is, meditation. When I was young, meditation sounded like something new agey. Unfortunately, in my mind, that meant I didn't need to bother. It wasn't until much later that I learned about the rich heritage of meditation in Christian tradition. As I have observed it, the main difference between secular meditation and Christian meditation is the content of one's mind. Most other forms of meditation seek to disengage with the world or simply empty the mind in order to seek peace. On the other hand, a devoted disciple of Christ would seek to replace the busyness of the world with the word of God or theological concepts like grace or challenges of conscience that we might need to implement. Much like prayer, meditation is a concentrated effort, concentrated, to retrain the mind upon God, shifting the focus. There are many times in the Bible where meditation is touched upon. In Psalm 46, verse 10, this is the New Living Translation, it says, be still and know that I am God. If you will, let me walk you through a simple meditation based on this verse. All right, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and take a deep breath. No falling asleep. Just listen to my words. Be still. Be still and know. Be still and know that He is God. Knowing that He is God is to let go and stop trying to control the world around you. Be still. Be still and know. Okay, no one fell asleep. Good. I love that one. It's a simple meditation on the Word of God. In King, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 and 12, this is from the New King James. Elijah is running from his enemies and hides on a mountainside. Then God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. If we don't take time to be still and quiet, it is so easy to miss the still, small voice. It's when we stop worrying about what to do, when we stop fretting over what decision to make. That's when our conscience plucks at the back of our mind. 
So what should we meditate upon? It can be hard to clear the mind and just listen for the voice of God without practice. Thankfully, we get a bit more direction here. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, the second part of the verse, this is the New Living Translation again, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Oh, now that is a great list. And it's straightforward. What is true? The word of God. What is honorable and right? The actions of Jesus. What is pure? The love and grace of God. What is lovely? The glory of God's creation or the kindness of the body of Christ. What is admirable? A whole host of actions throughout history of someone going above and beyond to serve those around them. And think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. When we devote time in our day to think, to dwell upon, to mull over or meditate on these kinds of things, our minds begin to transform. You are what you eat, and that doesn't just apply to food. Think about what you're thinking about and allow a time of meditation to bring growth in your walk with Christ. The last method of devotion I want to address is the Bible. I love the Word of God. I cannot tell you how much it means to me. When I was young, when I was a kid, and I had a nightmare, my mother would settle me down and instruct me to read Psalm 91. It is a psalm of comfort and reassurance. And I would read it under my blanket with a flashlight and then promptly zonk out. I was unconscious. When I was a teenager struggling with my own hypocrisy and failure. The grace of God poured into me through the words of Paul in his letter to the Romans. When I was approaching my high school graduation and was unsure of which path to take, the instructions in James chapter 1 to ask God for wisdom gave me reassurance. I love the history of the Bible. I love the poetry of the Bible. I love the raw, unfiltered humanity contained in the Bible. Now, there have been many fun descriptions of the Word of God. Um, Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. That's fun. Um, the owner manual, owner's manual to life, not bad. A love letter from God. Now, I I really do like that last one because a lot of folks look at the Bible as a religious rule book, in which case you miss out on an immense story of a loving God introducing himself and finding a way to save the world. And a lot of that involves the messiness of selfish people. But we can learn from all of it. In 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. God has a plan for us, and he wants to prepare us for that plan. But if we never take the time to listen to him, to take correction, and to learn to do what's right, we may never be properly equipped to do the good works that we need to do. The Bible provides these things for us. Please, if I can commun communicate anything here, it is that we need to be digging into the Word of God. It's not some kind of 
tick box on a list of things a Christian needs to do. Oh, I've prayed and I've meditated and I've read the Bible for today. You know that description of the Bible as a love letter from God? When my wife Hannah and I got engaged, we applied for a fiancé visa, which required her to remain in her home country of the United Kingdom until the visa was issued. I couldn't afford to go and visit her, so we simply had to wait, thousands of miles apart, for eight months. That was difficult. We spoke on the phone often. We were able to text and uh, FaceTime regularly. We also wrote letters. You remember those letters? Ink on paper, envelope, stamp, it's great, try it. There is something romantic about committing words to paper with a pen. During those eight months, I read and reread those letters that she sent because I loved her so much. It almost felt like I was with her when I read them. And you know, I still have those letters. Yeah, that is how God is writing to us. And that is how we should read those words written for us. We absolutely must devote time to devouring this bread of life. When I was a kid, my mom helped me with reading comprehension. And she would say, don't just read to say that you've read, read to hear what's being said. When you're a kid, you're like, whatever, you say that all the time. As I got older, I realized, actually, that's pretty clever because it rhymes and I remember it. <laughs> don't just read to say that you've read. Read to hear what's being said. Comprehension. Are you hearing what is being said? It is more important for you to read one verse and have it impact your life than to read a whole chapter, a whole book, and struggle to remember anything that you've just read. The way I like to approach Bible study, to approach reading the Bible with young people, is asking three questions about whatever we've just read, whatever we've just covered. First, what does this passage tell us about people? What does this passage tell us about God? And what does this passage tell me to do? Three simple questions. It's a simple way to start digging into Scripture. When we devote our time to the Word of God, we learn. When we devote our time to the Word of God, we grow. When we devote our time to the Word of God, our minds are transformed. These three methods of devotion, devoting our time to pray, to meditate, and read Scripture, it prepares and enables us to better live out the commandment to love our neighbor. Without devotion, it is so easy to grow bitter and resentful of others when we serve. We must be filled up by God before we can pour ourselves out for others, else we find ourselves empty, wrung, and wrung out. I'll close with a fanta fantastic object lesson. John Wesley demonstrated devotion in small, personal ways. One of my favorite examples is the scuffed wall beneath the window. Wesley had a desk built into a windowsill in his room, now called the preacher's room in uh, a place called New Room, Wesley's Chapel. There you can see there's a statue memorializing him. He had an inclined surface installed so that he could write his sermons 
while gazing out upon the world. He'd spend time there every day, praying and pondering over the Word of God and how best to communicate these thoughts to his congregation. As he would do so, he would swing his foot back and forth, kicking the wall. And the baseboard below the windowsill still bears the scuff marks of hundreds of hours of prayer, meditation, and study. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that we have free access to you through prayer, that we have free access to your word to study, that many of us do have time that we can devote to meditate. Remind us, encourage us this coming week to make that time, to let that be important enough that we devote our time to talking to you and listening, to being still and quiet and thinking, and to digging deeper into your word every day. Give us strength, and at times give us courage to continue doing so. We thank you, and we praise you in your name. Amen. May we always make time in our day May we always prioritize a conversation with our God, moments of silent thought and study of the Word of God. If we do so, then we can grow.